one. Pledge allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which, for which it stands, one nation under God. Call the roll. Director Daddy. Here. Director Finch. Here. Director Wyrick. Here. Director Thielke. Here. And Chair Hages. Here. Thank you. Okay, director announcements or comments. Peter? Not a. Jim? Nothing. Bill? No. Uh, we're, we're pursuing actively some funding options for some of those VRF projects that are, we would be eligible for, uh, the uh, river in, in, in stream flow. So we're we've identified a couple options. And the, the second thing is we have uh, presented a term sheet and have the, um, uh, the principals are uh, going back and forth on the issue of our membership in the Upper Ventura River Basin Agency. Okay. Bob? Nothing, nothing here. <coughs> uh, we were, uh, Present it with the uh, Casitas' uh, supply status report uh, first meeting in, in May. And we're currently at 80, about 81,000 acre feet of storage, which is about 10,000 acre feet above what is stage four. And we're, we're projecting that we'll be at stage four probably in six to eight months, roughly around December. The good news, however, is that demand is way below stage four allocations. So our demand for last fiscal year was 12,460 acre feet. And this year we're estimating it's gonna be 12,400 acre feet. That's a, on average, a 40% reduction <clears throat> from 2013. So whether we go to stage four or not, is the board will have to determine that. But right now we're in pretty good shape. As far as long-term projections, if we have no inflow into the lake, uh, we'll be well below stage five uh, in three years. And we're gonna, we'll be hitting a critical, critical pool at, in four years. But that's with no inflow at all, which Hopefully that's highly unlikely. And that's with continued uh, demand of about 12,500 acre feet. So sometime in there, we would have to reduce that significantly. And is the stage four by December projection, that's also a no flow, no inflow projection? Yeah, we figure we won't get any inflow before December anyway. Okay. So. okay. And, and of that 12,000, city of Ventura is about a quarter to a 30% of it? Uh, the city's been around 3,000, well, yeah. they were under 3,000 acre feet for two or three years, they're around 3,000 to 3,200 right now. So in last year's number, were they that 3,000 odd? Yes. So they were about a quarter-ish? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's pretty, it pretty much three to them, six plus a little bit to ag, and around four to M and I, and that number doesn't include the OI groundwater basin. So, okay. General Manager comments, John. Uh, just briefly, I don't have a whole lot to say. It's taken me a few days to get get my feedback under me with my trip, um, but um, I have been asked to work on some numbers related to metering. And uh, I just thought I'd share just some quick numbers. Uh, Roberto has, has put some uh, spreadsheets together that looks at our, our registered wells, uh, those that are metered, how many of those are under two acre feet or actually equal to or, or less than two acre feet and how many use zero. So the number of wells we have registered about 169. Uh, the metered are 85 of those. Of the wells that are equal to or less than 200 or two acre feet, it's 99. And 35 wells are reporting zero use. 
So that was all for 2021. Any questions about that? Based, based on the spreadsheet in our packet, it really kind of just looks like there's about 12 people that had a few blanks. And if you hit those 12, you'd pick up 95% of the volume. That's true. That's true. So it's really kind of our big bumpers to get most of the, the big volume out of the basin. We'll, we'll make that information available. We're still working on it, but I, I want to make sure we finally vet it and get it sorted right. And then hopefully by next board meeting, we'll provide you that information in a written form. John, uh, could you answer a, a question on page? There is no page. Um, it's about the second or third page. It's got about two dozen uh, ends down by the meter. Right. What are our regulations? I thought everybody had to be metered in the basin. No? No. Um, there were some provisions, and I, I'll have to go back and look. I didn't prepare for this meeting, but the provisions, as I recall, under uh, OBGMA that you didn't have to meter if you were uh, two acre feet or less under Sigma, um, you're not required to, to meter unless under uh, two acre feet or less. So I need to go back and I'll bring that back to you next meeting meters um, to show you what we have. And as I know, as Peter Candy has spoke previously, uh, we have the Sigma regulations, but, but OBGMA has their own authority as well. And so, um, but many of those meters that were, many of those wells that weren't metered are pretty low use. And then there was a number for years that were ag meters that were doing it based on crop factors. And OBGMA had allowed that at one time, but that's all been uh, uh, removed from its regulations. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. Peter Candy here. Um, uh, John, I, I do believe uh, that there is no exemption in the OBGMA ordinances for de minimis extractors. In other words, everybody's required to be metered. Uh, and if your meter's not operational for whatever reason, you still have to report based on estimated water use. Um, Sigma uh, came along later and uh, Sigma does provide exemptions for de minimis extractors. Um, where the two uh, come together, <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. But at this point, it's my understanding, and we'll all go back, and John and I will work on this and confirm for you at the next meeting, uh, but my understanding is that uh, all extractors in the basin, all registered wells need to be metered. That's per OBGMA ordinance. Yeah, I think Ordinance 11 calls for all, all, all wells to be metered and a minimum charge of one acre foot per acre, even if they don't use anything. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Ordinance 11 is the operative ordinance. Okay. We'll bring that information back, um, kind of give you a recap of those ordinances in Sigma and uh, let you know when they were, when our OBGMA ordinances were approved. The biggest problem with the OBGMA ordinances, it's just been the ability to follow up and, and uh, uh, pursue with well owners to make sure that they get they get their meters installed. Okay. Anything else, John? No, that's it. <clears throat> okay. Status basin status report, Jordan. Thank you, Chair Hages. Let me share the screen here. Okay, uh, today 
put together a presentation I'm calling The Summer, the Swales, and the Swazi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> apologies for the alliterations. It's always fun to do that and keep it a little bit on the lighter side when you're talking about such a grave subject as water. Uh, but this is what we're going to talk about as we talk through the conditions of the 2021 to 22 water year to date. Uh, we're not expecting much more precipitation this, uh, this water year. Um, here we are at the end of May, not a lot on the horizon that we can tell uh, unless you're right on the coast and you get that two one hundredths of an inch of drizzle that uh, blanketed much of the, the coastal edge. But uh, on the valley floor, we're at 14.90 inches uh, and 22.87 on the, on the ridge above where much of the precipitation uh, comes and that's where much of the recharge originates. Uh, that's roughly two-thirds of the annual average. Certainly better than last year where we had 10 inches less than that on the valley floor. The outflow side, uh, we measured a 0 0.21 CFS uh, the other day, uh, Tuesday, May 24th. That equivalent equates to about 94 GPM or about 12 acre feet that month. Uh, but if we think about that in the water year to date, we've seen on average about 320 acre feet escape of the basin of surface flow equates average 307 gallons per minute that's 0 0.685 cfs so this is exclusive of the major storm flows because what we measure is what is flowing out when you can stand in the creek when you can measure it when it's calm enough to get a good uh, get a good reading uh, so we're not there when it's turbid and three feet deep and would sweep you out down to Ventura. So we avoid those times, but those certainly <coughs> would uh, be recorded in some of the county gauges and DWR's gauges uh, in, um, and uh, uh, State Water Re Resources Control Board gauges, et cetera, that line San Antonio Creek and of course uh, the USGS gauges at, um, at Casitas Vista Bridge. So what you're seeing there is really what this is what effectively the what, we're, what we've called the perch system uh, is yielding to San Antonio Creek absent the major flashy surface flows that originate and flow across the basin. How does that look on on the uh, graphic portion? As you know, I love this graph. Uh, it's something that we've sort of invented ourselves, but really based here. And every time I look at it, I love what I see, especially this time of year. Um, we can go through all of this, but really what jumps out at me today is the, the hydrologic cliff of, that you see on the light blue system. And what, that, what, what jumps out to me today about this is, is on this light blue graph, uh, the light blue portion and the major, major central portion of the graph, you have the shaded blue representing where water is flowing in elevation across the basin in San Antonio Creek. So where the light blue columns are fully through the vertical length of the, uh, of the, of the graph going from 880 feet elevation down to 600 feet elevation, that's where basin, that's where the San Antonio Creek is flowing continuously across the Ohio Basin. Where it's absent is where it starts to daylight at a point south of, of typically Grand Avenue Bridge or so. Um, and we map that at least monthly as it marches southward as conditions dry up. And now that we have one, two, three, four, five, six years of this, you see a pretty consistent stair step there that right about 740 feet elevation, it just takes that step down. A relatively rapid step down from an upper portion to the, the lower portion. So you're going from a 740 foot elevation rapidly downward to about 650 feet elevation of the daylighting groundwater in San Antonio Creek. Very correlative with the elevations of the known uh, perched aquifer system. You eat a little bit of water at the top, 
coming in and then it rapidly declines as another strata is contributing to, uh, to that flow. But what's interesting is that that six year consistency absent the 2021 relatively dry year uh, is that the main aquifer system there in the darker blue hydrograph, that's at the Elrod well to date, uh, has its fluctuations in keeping with the amount of water in storage with the basin. It's really independent of what that big fiscal or hydrologic cliff is uh, in the, uh, that we see at those elevations that I was describing. So that's one of the interesting things we see about this graph today. Uh, of course, we have much more detail in this and, and we can go over it and have, uh, but currently we're down very low uh, in terms of discharge uh, in CFS as well as the elevation side relatively early uh, in the season given that it still two thirds of the precipitation on average. So this is where that water starts flowing uh, in San Antonio Creek. So we map this via GPS. Looks a little bit different than previous years. Where you can see where this is graphically, uh, I think speaks more to what it to to what it means rather than the map portion you saw on the previous slide, because you see we're down near where weeds and reeds are really more, um, they're more sustained, they're more perennial. This is an area that always seems to have this flow. It's supporting that tree life. Here's where we measure that outflow point of the basin. You can see quite a bit of, of the succulents and such that are uh, growing in the uh, in the creek channel itself, and of course the springtime foliage. The yellow line across the middle of that is our tape, where we measure this at tenth of a foot lateral intervals. Coming out of the Fox Creek or Montgomery Creek, underneath Creek Road, still a little bit of a trickle, but you put those together, and that's where that's where our 0.21 CFS is exiting the basin as surface flow that's measurable as surface flow. Going further down, uh, down San Antonio Creek, you see quite a bit of, of flow that will dolphin. It'll go up and down and be present and absent intermittently uh, as the alluvium thickens and thins. But by the time we get down to Old Creek Road Bridge, where the county gauge is there in the background, you see uh, effectively a full infiltration before this enters the upper Ventura River groundwater basin. Here's where that opposite, looking down from the bridge at that, at that point comes. So you can see where water is present and then literally just stops, just up, upstream from the Girl Scout Council. But by the time you get down to the confluence of Ventura River, it's once again uh, cool and green and shady and, and quite a bit of water. It's, the major source is, of course, the Ventura River in this portion. So with respect to what's going on in the main portion of the basins, uh, this is the hydrograph of uh, historically 5L8 and 5L5, the Elrod well. Uh, and really, we started measuring the Elrod well uh, in the early 20 teens when they provided access to us for setting our logger and recording water levels at the high frequency that we do. Uh, so we haven't missed a peak and we haven't missed a nadir, which is shown on these hydrographs. So you see the, the more cleanly uh, delineated portion of this graph is on the right side, where we really just need to take the high, the low, annually, and then we also add the current. So the high this year was on April 7th of 167.65 feet below ground surface. Uh, that was up from the December 7th low of 188.64 feet. And then this week, we're at 175 feet. And that calculates to about 67% of basin capacity, uh, or 52,000 acre feet. And that's, again, based on the linear regression analysis that really simplifies it for this level of, uh, of information. Now, that's what's happening in the main system, <laughs> main aquifer system. And something's come up uh, recently that we have called the perched aquifer. And these next two slides, we kind of want to address what's in a name. And we call it a perched aquifer uh, because it's just perched here underneath the city on the southwestern side of the basin. 
Uh, but the technical term may be something of dispute because the textbook definition of a perched aquifer uh, is sort of like a, if you had a sandbox and you put a plate in the middle of the sandbox and then put more sand on top of the box and then poured water on top of that, the water would percolate to the plate, be saturated right on top of that plate, and then cascade off the sides of that plate down to the bottom of the sandbox. Okay, Perched aquifer textbook definition. Now, the question is, well, is that ex exactly what we have here? Well, of course not. We don't have a textbook here. We have a basin. We have aquifers. We have shallow aquifers, and we have deep aquifers, and they're clearly separated. Uh, the clay stratum that is represented in the plate in that described model then cascades down to the deeper aquifer. But here, from the perch system, it, it exfiltrates to San Antonio Creek. Oh, I like that new word, exfiltrate. Well, it's, it's a very old word, I think. Yeah, but, but new, my, new for me. All right. So the idea is that, is that if we call this a perched aquifer, someone's going to think of that plate in the sandbox. Well, that's not exactly what we've got here. So what we're proposing as a term of art and science is calling it the southwest uppermost saturated zone, the acronym of which is SWSZ. And we've had some legs with the San Antonio Creek Spreading Grounds Rehabilitation Project calling it the SAX grip. But if you say SWUSZ really quickly, it's pronounced SWUSZY. It's a bit easier to say and rolls off the tongue. And this includes, of course, what we've referred to as the perched aquifer. But importantly, it also includes the western saturated areas like the Arboleda and that portion up Stewart Canyon that is also on the western side and is clearly hydrologically or hydrogeologically separated from the main aquifer systems. But if we call it the Swazi or the southwest uppermost saturated zone, it really adds that technical accuracy to what is going on in the upper Ojai Basin and the Ojai Basin. And so we've got in this, in this Swazi the depth discrete monitoring well, we have environmental monitoring wells, we have the Ojai Valley Sanitary District Monitoring Network. We have the surface flows and, of course, recharge, all of which can, is a, I think it's a good way, while technically it's the same, calling it the SWSI is something that can give us uh, an idea that we're talking about this unique uppermost saturated zone of the Ojai Basin that is manageable with respect to monitoring, discharge, and recharge the surface flows. So, on that slide, George, I've never heard of the OV, the, the Sanitary District Monitoring Network. What's that? Okay, so a couple of years back, um, I think, let's say about 20, um, it was noted that, and you may have heard about this, that when water levels in the basin were high and it was raining a lot, the it went into the sewer lines and flooded downstream the I and I. sanitary district facilities. Right. And then the opposite was happening when water levels were low. Yeah. When, and that was because sewer pipes leaked. Now, uh, the, the idea of having that happen was kind of limiting to OI Valley Sands, so they started taking a look at this. And they found old monitoring wells from, uh, from gas stations, effectively, dry cleaners and such, uh, and drilled a few of their own and been monitoring these relatively frequently. And as when we were working with Dudek on this GSP, realized, hey, this is a really critical piece of the puzzle. Let's make sure that we're using these data to know how those water levels have changed on the perched system or the SWSI and how we can be, um, uh, how we can be better monitoring it going forward in the future. We can make groundwater contour maps with these dozen wells or so that are part of this OVSD monitoring network. But they're, they're all in the 30, 40 foot range, very exactly. shallow. Yeah, very shallow. And some are as shallow as 15 feet, uh, some are 25. But they all basically do the same thing, and that's monitor the SWSI. So the idea is that by incorporating those data, if not adding uh, data loggers to some of those wells in, in partnership with the OVSD, the OBGMA can continue to monitor this system not just with one data point that we have now at the depth discrete monitoring well on South Fulton Street, uh, or by monitoring the points at the um, uh, of discharge or exfiltrated groundwater, uh, but also 
the network and have a, a very good good handle on the changes in, in storage mm -hmm. there, uh, the flow directions within within the SWSI, and then also uh, whatever recharge projects are implemented over time can be better documented with that system. So excellent question, Jim. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it, it is something that it's kind of not really been widely reported uh, until now, and because it's the data are included in the GIS. Right. Thank you very much. Any questions for Jordan? Bill? Uh, General, a comment slash question. So I can't help but compare what we were talking before the meeting started that the nominal construction size. Nominal capacity of the Stewart Canyon Debris Basin, 300,000 cubic yards, translates about roughly 180 cubic, 180 acre feet. So potentially, I mean, I'm just looking at order of magnitude. We have a water year to date for exfiltration of 320 acre feet. So that's a meaningful possible supplement at 180 acre feet of potential storage if we had a especially since climate change is telling us we're going to be going more to episodic rain events yeah we went if we went from flashy to flashier yeah or flashiest uh, we've if that's what climate change does that's what climate change does and if it's if there's a potential way to store and capture a significant portion of the acre footage that does exfiltrate yeah to san antonio creek in a relatively dry year with two-thirds of the right uh, of the uh, annual average yeah certainly getting two-thirds of that and adding to it could make make up for some of those shortcomings that make make, make a difference climate change. yeah interesting anything else no. Jim uh, Bill, you have, you're talking about the basin at uh, the top of Kenyatta the Pratt Canyon yeah, Trailhead yeah yeah and what was your math? That well, I, he, we worked so together on the, the, the report. I found, a, uh, I, I did a Google search and found another, I went through a couple steps and found out that the nominal capacity when constructed was 300,000 cubic yards. That's a capacity as if it were a, right. an empty yeah. basin. They could, could handle up to 300, when built. Of course, who you know, it's filled in now, of course, but maybe some. But they have emptied they it out. It. Yeah, they clean it. So they, the, they, uh, the, the nominal capture capacity for the, in that debris basin was 300,000 cubic yards is what this original construction reference indicated. And, and 300,000 cubic yards equate times 7.48 divided by 43.5. It gives you that 186 acre feet. I just I just looked it up. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I and I don't I didn't look it up. I'm just thinking it doesn't look like more than five acres and at five acres you'd need well at ten acres you'd need eighteen. Five you'd need thirty six. Yeah. It's pr well you know, if you stand and on the downstream side of that dam it's pretty deep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I I, yeah, I can't attest to it. All I can I, I just so, decided to try to find the original yeah, no, I'll, design I'll do my capacity. Thing, yeah. Back of the envelope math, it's not a, it's not a small drop in a bucket. Right. Yeah. yeah, and you could sustain the flow for quite a ways into the dry season. Because that was creek flows, when, when we have normal rain, it flows all year round, I think. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Okay, public comments. Is there any public uh, on Zoom that have comments on items not on today's agenda? Hearing none, consent items. We, I, we don't have any consent items today. Action items, update on groundwater sustainability plan. Who's going to do that? I think Devin's going to do that today or Trevor. I'm not sure who. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to take this one. Um, let me share screens here. 
Um, okay. Uh, all right. So nice to see everyone again. For those of you that don't remember, Trevor with Dudek here, a senior hydrogeologist. And I'm going to give a really brief overview of kind of where we're at with the GSP um, and really breaking down into two steps. Uh, we received some comment letters on the GSP following submittal of the GSP uh, in January. We received those letters in April. We'll discuss kind of who provided those comments and what we recommend uh, or how we recommend responding to them. Uh, and then we'll talk about next steps for the GSP in terms of implementation. Um, so really it's not a super pretty presentation, just some text with some slides or some slides with some text. Uh, by all means, if you have any questions as I'm walking through things, uh, please feel free to interrupt me and I can elaborate in more detail. Um, really, so what we're gonna start out with is the comment letter. So we submitted the GSP to, to the Sigma portal in January that opened up a 75 day comment period and the GSP received three different comment letters. One was from uh, the National Marine Fisheries Services. The other was from uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and then a consortium of non-governmental organizations that includes eight, er, organizations like the Nature Conservancy, California Audubon, um, and Union of Concerned Scientists. And, and really the, the primary thrust of these uh, comment letters was how the GSP characterized interconnected surface waters, how it used that characterization then to support um, kind of how we dealt with the establishment or lack of establishment of sustainable management criteria for GDEs and interconnected surface waters. Uh, and then also there was some comments on how uh, the hydrogeologic conditions in the southwestern portion of the basin uh, were represented with data and kind of how additional data can be collected to support characterization of, of that southwestern portion, uh, as Jordan mentioned, the Swazi uh, area. Um, so these aren't really new comments. They're comments we received uh, during the initial uh, draft document, uh, kind of open comment period. And really kind of the, the takeaway was there were, uh, CDFW provided some recommendations for the GSP, predominantly in, in kind of along the avenue of developing projects and, and quantitative detailed work plans that address reducing areas that we've identified as data gaps in the GSP, specifically regarding interconnected surface waters, groundwater dependent ecosystems. And the key one is really how pumping impacts uh, groundwater discharges to San Antonio Creek. Uh, I think that these are um, kind of nice pieces of information because they really uh, dovetail on what was presented in chapter four of the GSP where uh, specific projects were identified we talked about a GDE assessment. We talked about the development of a sampling and monitoring program uh, and a groundwater extraction monitoring program that really kind of align nicely with these comments or these recommendations. Um, additionally, CDFW recommended the incorporation of their, their newly developed in-stream flow requirements and numerical model results. Uh, and we've provided, again, that comment letter to the uh, state board documenting kind of the, our current understanding of the numerical model that was developed for the Ventura River watershed and why we don't believe that uh, incorporation into the GSP is appropriate at this time. All this to say, uh, what do we do with them? So it, it's a little bit of a tricky situation because the GSP has been submitted. Uh, it's not gonna be revised. DWR has two years to uh, provide comments and an assessment of the GSP. Uh, these comment letters are also out in the public. If you go to the Sigma portal, you can click on the public comments section of the GSP page and these comment letters will uh, be present and, and, and DWR will likely review these comment letters as they review the GSP. So we've talked uh, briefly with John about how to kind of approach this. Uh, we've talked about preparing some comment letters and what we would recommend is that we prepare comment letters that would then, a response to comment letters that would then be uploaded to the Sigma portal. So these comment letters, response to comment letters rather would be uh, kind of living documents that stand alone from the GSP. So they're not embedded in a large appendix or embedded in a chapter of the GSP. They would just be right there, uh, right right beside uh, where these comment letters are, are submitted to the Sigma portal, available for public review and for DWR to review as they review and assess the GSP as well. And then as part of that, uh, kind of the next steps for the GSP implementation would be to coordinate with uh, 
uh, GMA staff uh, to identify kind of high priority projects and funding opportunities to help reduce these data gaps. And we can acknowledge that in these comment letters that then get submitted to the Sigma portal. Any questions so far? This kind of wraps up the comment letter discussion and, and we'll jump into the next steps. Bill, I have two questions. Yeah. On the first bullet, well, the first major bullet uh, and the, and the sub-bullet, they said develop work plans and pursue projects that characterize interconnected surface waters in particular and then two others. Mm -hmm. Were they specific about what they thought were inadequacies in the analysis to date and the data developed to date? Uh, yes, the, the different agencies are specific. I have kind of in the back of my mind the 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 nymphs characterization of things because I was just reading the letter right before this, but but specifically they talk about how our, our model kind of demonstrates that there's this groundwater discharge to San Antonio Creek, how that indicates that uh, the two systems are connected and that pumping may impact um, base flows. Well, how, um, what I'm trying to say is, did they cite data to support that that hypothesis? Uh, so. No, and I, I think that's the key thing that we want to highlight in the response to comment letters is that the information that we have really supports our characterization of these systems as a data gap and really supports the pursuit of additional projects that can characterize, better characterize the degree to which surface water and groundwater right. are or are not connected and really the impact that pumping has on that. So. This is in line with what Jordan is collecting in the southwestern part of the basin with the depth of discrete monitoring wells. Um, and, but, the sec and the second question on the last bullet, did they provide specific evidence of why they felt their in-stream numerical model was superior to the one in the GSP? Uh, no. they. They have the. They took the position it's best available science, and that our initial response wasn't adequate. Kind of again, how we plan to respond to that is is we've developed a, a detailed uh, comment on the model itself that we submitted to the state board, and also we don't really have again this uh, quantitative understanding of how pumping is going to be impacting flows in San Antonio Creek, which then makes it difficult to to establish. A sustainable management criteria. And, I think and that's, are you using the word state board and DWR sort of interchangeably? Uh, no. So, so uh, state water resources control board developed the uh, Ventura River watershed model. Yes. Right? So we submitted the comment letter to that agency, and then CDFW submitted this comment letter describing the important. The, so we are uh, we're responding and we're sending anything we're copying to the state water resources control board. We're copying to DWR. Well. Uh, no, these would be comment. Uh, these would be letters submitted to DWR, not submitted to the state. The, the, uh, so when you said to the state board, you meant DWR. Uh, the the letters, the response to comment letters, I they would be submitted to Sigma to the DWR's website. Dudek also provided a, a comment on the Ventura River watershed model that we submitted to okay. the state uh, water resources control board. I, I, I was just wondering whether it's a good practice or not to make sure that anything we, we submit to State Water Resources Control Board is our CDFW is also copied to DWR since they're the review agency. Uh, that's a, a good question. I'm not sure the degree to which the, the two agencies communicate. Uh, and it's not, something not that well. we did. Not well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point and for sure. When we respond to the DWR, we can provide links to what we or provide references to what we provided as comments to the State Water Resources Control Board, um, and yeah, copying them on on the different responses. I'm not sure what kind of best practices are for that. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you need formal approval of your uh, recommended responses? Uh, it, it would be, uh, I think, good to get board's approval for us to move forward, and then we can coordinate with John on, on providing John those those letters that they would ultimately come from the GSA. So these would be response to comments that would get uploaded to DWR from the GSA 
rather than from Do Deck. Yes. Second. Call the roll. Director Daddy? Yes. Yes. Director Finch? Yes. Director Wyrick? Yes. Director Thielke? Yes. And Chair Hages? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. All right. Anything else on the uh, GSP? Uh, just very briefly what next steps are for the GSP. Uh, it would be kind of we're moving into the implementation phase where we look at the kind of projects that we've discussed as being uh, identified as areas where we can reduce data gaps in the basin and we would coordinate with uh, DUDEC is happy to help with uh, kind of the pursuit of funding for these projects so we were aware of two different funding opportunities that are on the horizon specifically uh, prop 68 funding that's going to open solicitation in september and then gwr's uh, tss funding uh, and though these two funding sources could then be used to kind of identify and and partially fund the implementation of projects specifically uh, related to what these comment letters highlight is is a data gap in the basin with gdes and interconnected surface waters so this is again something that that uh do that can coordinate with the agency on how to best move forward with the implementation of the GSP through pursuit of these projects. So this is just kind of an informational slide of, of where the GSP can go in the next year. Okay, Bill has a question. Quick question, something I'm not, I want to find out more about, but apparently DWR has some sort of high level program for the state in terms of looking at how to reconfigure flood control infrastructure to achieve better uh, aquifer recharge. Um, they have some sort of staff section doing that. I'm not sure what funding sources that's connected to. I was wondering if you know anything about that. So I'm just was told that exists and don't know much more than that. I'm not sure what uh, part of DWR would be supporting kind of the the assessment of that and the applicability of that to these different projects. I know that Prop 68, you can you can pursue funding for projects like that, feasibility studies for something like that through this grant opportunity. But it's something that we can look into to see what type of technical support services are available uh, for flood control. And, and I'm and guessing also the, 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 the ground, the, 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 the the section that does is reviewing the groundwater, the groundwater uh, sustainability department, whatever they call it in DWR. I, they, I would think that department at least know who to go to. I, I haven't followed up like I should. I just was kind of wondering if you knew anything about it. Yeah, I'm not uh, as familiar with it, but it's something we can definitely uh, do some research on and report back on. All right, thank you, um, Jim. Have you heard is are any of these plans being tossed back in their laps or accepted or have you heard anything just statewide? Uh, so statewide. So DWR provided their initial uh, assessment of critically overdrafted basins. And I, there's a, I don't know the exact number that have been approved, but a large number of them have been sent back to the GSAs to say that they're incomplete and they require these revisions before DWR puts their stamp of approval on them. Uh, again, I don't know the number off the top of my head, um, but it, it was pretty a pretty large component of the critically overdrafted basins had their GSP sent back and, and DWR, DWR is requiring revisions. So outside of that, I think the, uh, there may be a few high priority basins. We worked on uh, the GSPs for the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. That, that included one high priority basin and two critically overdrafted, and those have been approved by DWR. Um, so even kind of the initial- Track record is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, the initial submittals of GSPs to the state have been reviewed, but the GSPs that were submitted in this last round are, are still under review. And I really wouldn't anticipate any reviews coming out for two years. DWR took their time for the critically the overdrafted time. basins. 
Okay. Thank you. Did you say the Fox Canyon was approved or a portion of it? Yes. Yeah. So, so Fox Canyon submitted, uh, we helped Fox Canyon prepare GSPs for the Foxnard Subbasin, Pleasant Valley, and Las Posas Valley Basin. And those three GSPs were approved by the state. That is good news. Those are tough ones. Yeah. Yeah. Hope that augurs well for ours. All right. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Next is a well owner's payments review. John? Let me unmute here. Um, I didn't have anything for this. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't work on putting the agenda together this, this month as well. So I don't have anything for you under, under item seven or excuse me, eight B. Okay. Uh, treasurer's report. Do you have anything on that? No, I, I sent, um, I just opened the agenda earlier today and noticed we didn't have the treasurer's report attached. So I'm going to bring that back to you next month. All right. Is there any other business? not we're adjourned at 4 47 all right great thank you